Memory for AQA Lab, 20 minute revision. Hi, I hope the revision's going well. I've got a short revision video for each section of paper one. If you find this video useful, try those. Also, if you want a section I'm about to do in more detail, I've got the entire memory unit broken down into longer videos. And of course, longer videos for all three papers, including all of paper one. The script of this video and other revision videos are on my Patreon feed, as a big thank you to support of the channel there. If you want to help the channel in creating psychology content, as well as getting access to the typed up version of everything I'm about to say, and more, follow the link below. I do recommend pausing at each title and guessing what I'm about to say, or you can just listen to me and run through this. Are you ready? Let's go. The Multisole Model of Memory, Agerson and Schiffer in 1968. Theoretical cognitive model of how the memory system processes information, three stores. First, sensory register. Receives raw sense impressions. Attention passes information to short-term memory. Coding is modality specific. Iconic is vision. Echoic is sound. Haptic is touch. Gustatory is taste. Olfactory is smell. Capacity is very large. For all sense impressions, each moment. Duration is very short. 250 milliseconds, but varies per store. Second, short-term memory. A temporary active store receiving information from the sensory register by paying attention, or from long-term memory by retrieval. Keeps information in short-term memory through maintenance rehearsal, or passes information on to long-term memory through elaborative rehearsal. Coding is acoustic, duration is approximately 18 seconds. Capacity is seven plus or minus two items from mill. Third, long-term memory very long duration or permanent memory storage, theoretically unlimited capacity. Forgotten information appears to just be inaccessible. Long-term memory is coded semantically in the form of meaning, and to use information it's passed to short-term memory through retrieval. Three types are episodic, semantic, and procedural. Capacity of the sensory register. Spieling found the recall of a random row of a 20-letter grid flashed to 1 20th second was high, suggesting all the rows were stored in the sensory register, so a large capacity. Capacity of short-term memory. Jacobs, 1887, found recall for lists of letters which was around seven items and nine for numbers, suggesting a limited capacity of the short-term memory. However, this can be improved by chunking, making small sets or groups of items. Capacity, long-term memory. Wagner, in 1986, created a diary of 240 events over six years. He tested himself on events and found recall was 75% after one year and 45% after five years suggesting a very large capacity, potentially limitless. Coding in the short-term and long-term memory stores. Badly, 1966, four 10-word lists to four participant groups. Word lists were acoustically similar or dissimilar, semantically similar or dissimilar. Found immediate recall was worse for acoustically similar, and recall after 20 minutes was worse with semantically similar. This suggests short-term memory is coded acoustically, and long-term memory is coded semantically with similar sounds or meanings causing confusion and recall. Duration of short-term memory. Peterson and Peterson in 1959 found a recall of three-letter trigrams, like HFR or TKD, was less than 10% after 18 seconds if performing an interference task, counting backwards, suggesting so short-term memory duration is very short. Duration of long-term memory. Barrick in 1975 found recall of school friends and photographs was 90% after 15 years, and still 80% for names after 48 years in participants ranging from 17 to 74, suggests the duration of long-term memory is potentially limitless. The multistore memory sees each store as a single unit, however there seem to be different types of long-term memory, and the working memory model explains short-term memory as a much more active system with multiple stores. The short duration of sensory register is supported by evolutionary theory. In the wild, quick reactions are vital for survival so only important information will be retained and processed. Too much information retained would lead to slower reactions. Capacitive short-term memory can be altered significantly by factors such as age and practice. This means the view of a fixed short-term memory capacity is incorrect. Types of long-term memory, episodic, semantic, and procedural. Long-term memory is storage of memories over a lengthy period of time. It's suggested that there are three types of long-term memory. These are either declarative, explicit, the what, meaning expressible in words, or non-declarative, implicit, the how. Episodic, memories of experience and events. Timestamp, so have a reference to time and place. Declarative, 
can be recalled consciously, autobiographical, and the strength of the memory is influenced by the emotion felt at the time. It's associated with the hippocampus and the prefrontal cortex. Semantic, memory for facts, meaning and knowledge. Declarative and recalled consciously. The strength is from the processing depth. Lasts longer than episodic and not time stamped. Episodic becomes semantic over time. Associated with the frontal cortex. Procedural. Unconscious memories of skills like riding a bike. Often learned in childhood. Not declarative and not recalled consciously. More resistant to forgetting than episodic or semantic. Associated with the motor cortex and cerebellum. Clive Waring has retrograde amnesia so can't remember his musical education. Episodic. However, remembers facts about his life. Semantic. He can also play the piano. Procedural. Due to anterior grade amnesia, he can't encode new episodic memories. But he can gain new procedural memories in experiments by repetition. This shows semantic, episodic and procedural memory are separate systems, suggesting different brain areas. Hertz in 1997 one file than male and females given tasks that tested either episodic or semantic ability. Found females were better on episodic tasks, but no different in semantic tasks. This suggests episodic and semantic are separate systems. Ideographic case studies lack the control to suggest a cause and effect relationship between the brain areas and memory functions. Case study subjects using memory research may be different to the normal population before the damage. The working memory model. Badley and Hitch, 1974, a theoretical cognitive model of information processing in short-term memory. Questions on the working memory model and the multi-store model will often credit the diagram. The phonological loop. Processes sound information, so acoustically coded. Contains the primary acoustic store, the inner ear, storing words recently heard, and the articulatory process, the inner voice storing via subvocal repetition. Capacity of two seconds. Visuospatial sketchpad. A limited capacity of around four objects and codes visuospatial information. Contains visual cache, a passive store of form and colour, and inner scribe or inner eye, an active store of spatial relationships. Central executive. The head of the model receiving sense information filters information before passing it on to the two slave systems, phonological loop and the visuospatial sketchpad. Central executive is limited in capacity, capable of dealing with only one strand of information at a time. Episodic buffer. As in 2000, the working memory model needed a store to hold and combine information from the visual spatial sketchpad, the phonological loop, the central executive, and long term memory. Phonological loop and visual spatial sketchpad. SC from Trojani and Grossi and KF from Shalise and Warrington both had short term memory difficulties with their phonological loop functioning, but not the visual spatial sketchpad after brain damage. Suggests phonological loop and visual spatial sketchpad are separate systems in separate brain regions. Visual spatial sketchpad, Kluwer and Zhao, found spatial performance of remembering locations of dots on a screen was more disrupted by a spatial interference task than a visual. Also, a visual task of remembering Chinese ideographs was more disrupted by visual interference, suggesting visual and spatial processing are separate systems in the visual spatial sketchpad. Central executive, Braver in 1977, provided biological evidence of the central executive in the prefrontal cortex via brain scans. Activation detected when completing central executive tasks and the level activity increased with the difficulty of the task. Short-term memory in the multi-store model is only a passive store of information. The working memory model is an improvement in the description as an active processor. Explanations for forgetting. Proactive and retroactive interference. Interference. This is where two lots of information become confused in memory, overwriting or blocking each other. Types of interference. Proactive, old info disrupts retrieval of new. Retroactive, new information disrupts the retrieval of old. Similarity. Interference is more likely when the two pieces of information are similar. This is termed response competition. Time sensitivity. Interference is less likely when there's a gap between the instances of learning. Retrieval failure due to the absence of cues. Retrieval failure or cue dependent forgetting. The information is in long term memory but forgetting happens due to the absence of prompts. Context-dependent cues. Being in a different place inhibits recall as lacking environmental cues from encoding. State-dependent cues. Different mood or state of arousal inhibits recall. The internal environment is different from encoding. Interference. 
Smith from 2000 conducted a questionnaire on 211 participants between 11 and 79 years old, including a map of the area around their old school without street names, found the more times an individual moved home, the fewer street names could be recalled, suggesting retroactive interference. Remembering new streets make recalling old streets harder. Context-dependent cues. Gotten and badly in 1975. Material learnt underwater or on land. Found recall was best with divers if they learnt in the same context or environment as tested. Suggesting environmental cues promote recall. State-dependent cues. Overton in 1972. Material learnt drunk or sober. Found recall was best when in the same internal state. Suggests internal cues promote recall. Knowledge file forgetting works can have practical applications such as effective revision strategies. Factors affecting the accuracy of eyewitness testimony. Misleading information. Formation of memories is influenced by schemas. Bartlett in 1932 said memories are not accurate snapshots of events, but are reconstructions. Influenced by attitudes, stereotypes and bias. If recall is not objective, then this is a problem for eyewitness testimony. Reconstructive memory. Memory isn't an accurate recording, it's reconstructed in recalling, producing errors called confabulations. Leading questions. Questions that imply a particular answer can influence how a memory is recalled. This could be due to an actual change to the memory, substitution bias, or not to a change in memory but due to an emotional pressure to give a particular response. Response bias. Post-event contamination, discussion. This is when the recalling events by one witness alters the accuracy of the recall by another witness. This could be due to memory conformity. The witnesses go along with the other accounts for social approval. Loftus and Palmer in 1974 found that when shown clips of traffic accidents and then asked the leading questions about the car's speed, 45 participants estimated a higher speed if more extreme verb was used. Contacted, the average was 31.8 and smashed was 40.8, suggesting leading questions alters witnesses' recollection. Loftus and Palmer in 1974, in a follow-up study, found participants were twice as likely to report seeing broken glass if the verb smash was used rather than hit in a questionnaire one week after seeing the traffic accident clip, suggesting misleading information can recall in substitution, not just response bias. Gavitt, in 2003, found that when able to discuss alternate videos of the same crime, 71% of the participant pairs included information that wasn't in their own video compared to 0% of pairs who couldn't discuss, showing memory conformity. If witnesses are warmed of its effects, the impact of post-event discussion can be reduced. Bonder, 2009. Factors affecting the accuracy of eyewitness testimony, anxiety. Anxiety is a mental state of arousal that includes feelings of extreme concern and tension. Eyewitness testimony after violent crimes include high anxiety, but research in eyewitness testimony often has no emotional impact on the participant, resulting in low validity. Decreases recall. High levels of anxiety produce poor recall of the perpetrator. This may be due to weapon effect, focus, weapons causing anxiety, witnesses are distracted, focusing on the weapon rather than the criminal. Increased recall. A state of arousal could improve general alertness or awareness of the situation and surroundings, and the emotional aspect could improve memory encoding. The yerkes dodson law of arousal. These conflicting results could be explained by accuracy increasing as anxiety rises due to attention to a point in which anxiety becomes too high and more stress results in lower accuracy. Johnson and Scott in 1976 found participants were more able to recall a man from a photograph if overhearing a normal conversation and then seeing him walk out with a pen and greasy hands, 49%, than if the conversation was hostile, breaking glass, and walking out with a knife and bloody hands, 33%, suggesting weapon focus. Peters, in 1988, found that participants who visited a healthcare centre were better able to recognise a researcher than a nurse who gave an injection, suggesting weapon focus on a needle in a real-world situation. Yuval and Kutzel, in 1986, interviewed 13 witnesses to a real-life shooting in Canada four months later. Recall was as high as 88%, and those who reported the highest levels of stress at the time gave the most accurate responses. Suggests anxiety might increase the accuracy of recall, the opposite effect of lab studies. Research on the accuracy of eyewitness testimony has led to real-life applications, such as the development of the cognitive interview. Improving the accuracy of eyewitness testimony, the cognitive interview. Eyewitness testimony is inaccurate, shown by studies on anxiety and leading questions. Fisher in 1987 
define the standard interview from observations of police interviews in Florida. Quick, direct and closed questions, not representing the witness's mental representation. Recall was led by police and witnesses couldn't talk freely and were frequently interrupted. Fisher and Geisman in 1985 suggested the cognitive interview, including the following techniques. Context reinstatement, mentally returning to the crime scene, triggers environmental and emotional contextual cues. Report everything. All details, even if they seem irrelevant, should be mentioned. Recall from a changed perspective. Consider the perspective of witnesses or the perpetrator to disrupt schema or biases. Recall in reverse order. Switch to different chronology or timelines. Check the accuracy and challenges expectations. The cognitive interview was improved into the enhanced cognitive interview, focusing on reducing anxiety and building trust in the interviewer, and the modified cognitive interview for use with children and people with learning difficulties. This increased the usefulness of the cognitive interview. Fisher in 1989, 16 detectives at Florida Police Department. Two matched pairs groups, matched on prior interview performance, on trained in cognitive interview techniques, was compared to a control group. The cognitive interview group gained 63% more information than the control in subsequent interviews, suggesting the cognitive interview is an effective technique for real police officers in the field. Mimon conducted a meta-analysis of 57 studies, comparing the cognitive interview, the enhanced cognitive interview, or modified cognitive interview to control groups, found the cognitive interview produced significantly more accurate recall than non-cognitive interview interviews, especially in older people. Cognitive interviews are time-consuming, require more time than officers have operationally available. Also, it's not effective in improving recognition of suspects in identity parades or photographs, limiting its use even if it's effective. Fantastic and not a bad time at all for all of memory. I want to do a shout out to my newest patrons, Lauren Holly Cooper and Yasmin. I hope the typed up script of this video will be helpful. And I've also added a set of micro memory flashcards to the Patreon feed, summarising all sections of memory into one side of A4. Cut them out and let me know how you find them. But don't forget, there are loads of free psychology resources for everyone at my website, psychboost.com. I recommend if you're in the final days of your revision to try out my quizzes, they're really helpful. Uh, best of luck with your paper one, everyone.